WesleyGospel.com. Welcome to WesleyGospel.com. Today I want to talk about uh, Bank of America savings accounts or savings accounts in general um, and why they're important for the process of capital accumulation and uh, financial growth and investing, etc., and what to do with the stock returns after you get them. Uh, after you get the money that comes in, what are you going to do? You're going to put it. You're going to put it somewhere, right? You're going to you normally want to put it into a savings account unless you have some expense that you need to meet. Um, so that's that's where you know I think a lot of people that don't get involved in investing, they don't get involved in stocks, they don't get involved in value line, they don't get involved in stock analysis, they don't get to the point really where a savings account becomes like a really serious thing to think about. Or they're, they're the type of person who has a really high paying job and they pull 20% off their paycheck and put it in the savings account. But again, it's not really taken that seriously because maybe you've got, I don't know, $23,000 in there. It's not a lot. So the savings account, I would say probably by and large, uh, is is probably not used in the way that I'm talk I'm going to be talking about here by most people maybe maybe country club type people or um, golf golf club you know really rich people upper middle class and upper class people but um, you know the average the average investor doesn't get to this point and and uh, so what I'm going to talk about here is really big on the on the part of capital accumulation from what I can understand the biblical basis for it is from the red letters of Jesus Luke 19 23 why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest um, this is talking about the practice of rich people um, taking stock returns and putting them into a uh, savings account at the bank um, with a little bit of interest on it. Okay. Now, um, so there you have it. I mean, okay, I guess we can end the video, right? <laughs> or end, end the uh, end the end the subject. Um, that's basically. I mean, if you look at Luke 19. The parable of the pounds, or in the NIV version, they call it the parable of the ten minus. Um, we have the basis of a stock portfolio here um, that is arranged in descending order uh, with the highest uh, uh, total return um, stocks at the top and then gradually descending to the ones with the lowest total return at the bottom. And then the final, the final conclusion is after you, um, you get your capital gains, you're going to put it into a savings account at the bank, Luke 19:23. Now, what what kind of goes on? What what about banking? What about American banking, in especially? Well, first off, you want to look at like maybe Bank of America. I would say um, as your primary banking instrument today. Uh, I, I personally use Bank of America and I feel like their online platform is extremely useful. Um, I wouldn't invest stock in Bank of America because if you plug them into inspireinsight.com they're LGBT all over the place. Um, but that being said, um, uh, banking is a biblical principle. Uh, that Jesus himself teaches, and I don't know of any banks today that are 100% LGBT free. If I ever found out about one, I would I would consider it. Um, but the most important thing about banking is that you need to be banking with people who know what they're doing, have a lot of financial strength, and a lot of financial collateral to be able to prevent bank runs or bankruptcies. A bankruptcy um, was usually a uh, apply it to an individual person that goes broke and they're called a bankrupt but a bankruptcy is also applied to an insolvent bank that might fail in its business practices and that bank has become bankrupt um, as well so in the Great Depression 
there were what you call bank runs where where large angry mobs of people worried mobs of um, bank customers would crowd around the banks to try to get all their deposit money to come out because word spread like wildfire that the bank was going under. You know, the concept of that, what does that mean when a bank goes under? It basically means that um, all the deposit money that the customers are putting in the bank, there's no collateral for it. And so the bank becomes in debt to all of those customers. And the money that is coming out of the bank is not the bank's money, it's the customer's money. So that means that the customers who are making the deposits, they're losing money at that point. They're not going to get it. They're not going to see it again. And so that's why the bank runs would happen is that people would crowd around to get their money pulled out real quick so that they would, you know, they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't, they would still be able to see their money again. And you see the, the, uh, the concept of the bank run in It's a Wonderful Life where George Bailey is about to go on his honeymoon until Mr. Potter manipulates the situation and creates a bank run and people are desperate and they're afraid that they're going to lose all their money. And, and so what does George Bailey have to do? Well, he has to pull uh, $10,000 of his own saved up honeymoon money and uh, loan it out to people as a collateral because of the bank run. Now, in other words, let me let me just break that down a little bit, okay? There's basically with a bank. I'm not a banker, so I, okay, I could be I could be partially inaccurate in what I'm saying here, but my understanding of it is is that a bank has basically two forms of money, debits and credits, and uh, the 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 people who deposit money is one category of money. That's the people's money. And then there's another category of money, and that's the bank's money. That means that's money that was there before the people came in to put their money there. They had it back in the vault in the form of gold, in the form of cash, whatever. Um, that's their reserves. OK, that's the bank's money. No matter what, that's that bank, that money belongs to the bank. It doesn't belong to any of the customers at all. That's not the customer's money at all. 100 percent bank's property, that money. OK, but then there's this other category of money within the bank, and that is the money that belongs to the people that bank there. And you might say, well, well, what benefit is this to the bank? Well, if if the bankers are careful with their accounting practices, uh, the money can benefit a win-win situation both ways, mainly in the uh, the protection of the people's money and in the sense of creating uh, security for loans, for business loans, and for mortgages. Um, so it is a useful institution to have in any community to have a bank. But you have to understand the the is it's not it's not a melting pot. It's not a bank is not supposed to be, let me rephrase that, a bank is not supposed to be a melting pot of one form of money. It's supposed to be it's supposed to be divided between look, Bank of America's got their money and and then all the people that are banking in Bank of America, that's their money. And there should be a, a clear dividing line down the middle that the bank doesn't touch these people's money. That's their money. Uh, and if they want to pull it out, they can pull it out. Um, and so bank runs in the past where happened when there was a commingling of these funds. And there was lazy accounting on the bankers, and the banks would lose their reserves and start surviving on the people's money. That would call, cause a bank run, and people would start rioting and mobbing these banks to get them to get their money back.
and that happened in the 19, 1930s and a little before that as well. So eventually the president was pressured. I think it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt or some, some one of those guys. The president was pressured to first off confiscate all personal gold ownership in the United States and have it concentrated in Fort Knox. That was the first thing they needed to do. They did this to concentrate reserves as collateral to be able to support all of these banks. The second thing that they did is they established a government agency called the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And um, this organization today has about $2 billion in financial reserves. This is meant to bail out banks when they run on hard times. Okay, so if a bank of any size runs into hard times through lazy accounting practices, through just bad banking habits, or whatever it is, or one of their depositors loses up to $250,000 out of a savings account, the FDIC can go to their reserves and make up the difference. And the reason why the government helps these banks is to prevent widespread panic from occurring, like it did in the bank runs of the Great Depression. The FDIC was, was, was created for one reason only, and that was to prevent bank runs from ever happening again. And it has worked. There haven't been any bank runs since 1933, since the FDIC was put in. And um, we, we hear about banks having running on hard times. Bank of America ran on hard times a couple of years ago. Um, BB&T ran on hard times and formed into Truist. But we never heard about anybody doing any bank runs. That never made any national news. The, the government, hush, hush, you know, just like a UFO sighting, they, they don't want pre people to get, go into widespread panic, so they'll send the men in black to get people to talk them out of the alien encounters. Well, it's the same way with bank problems. The FDIC was, was created to give people a sense of, uh, um, Gary North says this in Honest Money, that it's an illusion of security. Now, in a way, I, I kind of agree with him in, in saying that um, the FDIC is an illusion of financial security, but, act, but at the same time, they do have $2 billion in financial reserves, and um, there haven't been any bank runs for a century in this country. So I think the FDIC has something legitimate about it. Um, uh, I think they have been bailing out banks. I think they have been helping, um, you know, incongruent and, and banking mistakes that have occurred to help um, widespread bank run panics um, and prevent that sort of a thing from happening in America. And so in that sense, any bank that has an FDIC sticker on it, it's usually a gold or bronze sticker that you'll see um, at the desk of, of a bank teller. Um, it is a good bank to be banking with. Okay, they've got they've got government backing, and um, so what does it mean for the individual? It means that you can deposit your stock returns, um, your capital gains, into a savings account at any bank with an FDIC insured a capability up to the amount of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That means that that money is safe, safe and sound, and is protected by the FDIC federal government, which was established for the sole purpose of preventing bank runs. So if some banker does a bad job or some computer glitch happens and all of your money is gone or some large chunk of it is gone out of your savings account, some weird thing happens, you can appeal to the FDIC and they can bail you out and, and replenish the funds for you. Now, if you have your doubts about this, as, 
as some people do, like Gary North, you can you can you can go in one of two directions. Number one, you can blow away the doubts and put your trust in the bank. Okay, that's one one option. And honestly, I think that would be probably the option Jesus would lead to, since it says in Luke 19:23. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when it came back, I would have collected it with interest? Jesus is talking about putting your capital into a FDIC insured interest bearing savings account in the bank, in Bank of America. That's what Jesus is talking about there in Luke 19.23. But what do people like Gary North and hyperinflationist uh, people say? Well, basically, what they say is that you should you shouldn't uh, put so much stock in putting uh, all of your accumulated capital into savings accounts, but rather what you should do is go to MoneyMetals.com and buy like a million dollars worth of gold and keep it at your house or something. And I think that's ridiculous. I mean, there's not there's nothing wrong with buying, say, a you know, a whole large portion of gold coins or whatever and storing it somewhere. As collateral in the case of a hyperinflation crisis, that could happen, okay? <clears throat> but to get to the point, to make it come to the point where you're not going to put money in a savings account, I think is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty weird and pretty uh, unsound, and um, it's just based on conspiracy theories, basically, um, not trusting in the government, not trusting that they really mean what they say and 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 uh oh no, and let's also put it this way maybe even not trusting god that he can protect your money after you put it in the bank jesus said not to store up treasures for yourself where thieves can break in and steal and yeah thieves can break into banks and steal stuff that can happen but how much better is it to have the government insure the money if they do that if you store a hoard of gold in your house, thieves can break in and steal, and ain't no government going to come and help you out with that situation. So it's better to put the money in the bank, like Jesus says in Luke 19.23, and not so much listen to people like Gary North in the, his book Honest Money, where he's basically saying the FDIC is a joke, and you shouldn't trust the government at all, and they're all a bunch of scam artists and that none of them can be trusted in any capacity whatsoever, and that it's just a smokescreen to make you trust the government and to trust the banks. It's just a big smokescreen. Well, that's just ignorant. Okay, There's information on Wikipedia with references and everything to say that the FDIC has $2 billion in reserves and that it has a long history of bailing out and helping banks that when they've run on hard times. Okay, So Gary North is wrong in that. And that your money is relatively safe. Now, Jesus talks about the deceitfulness of riches. You shouldn't put all of your hope, trust, and, 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 and faith into money and into gold. Job says, if I have put my trust in gold, then I am liable. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of sin, right? You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't put your trust in these savings accounts. You shouldn't put your trust in them even in though they, these are sometimes referred to as trusts, right? Uh, you should put your trust ultimately in God. Yeah, is financial responsibility a good thing? Yeah, but there's limits to financial responsibility, and uh, that would be uh, whether or not your savings account is really solid. How do you know that? How do you know how solid that thing is? You don't. So... Um, saving and investing is a good thing, and it requires a lot of skill. But at the end of the day, you have to still trust God with the money with what you, that you've accumulated and where you're going to put it. You have to trust in providence of God, or you're going to drive yourself nuts. But it seems to be, from a commonsensical point of view, to put it into a Bank of America savings account with an FDIC insure, insurance deposit on it. So, what about people? who get crazy rich. Well, from what I can understand, uh, Bank of America allows you to open up as many as 15 or more savings accounts. Could you imagine having as many as 15 savings accounts 
um, all of them stacked with two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That'd be insane. Let's see here, two hundred fifty thousand dollars times fifteen. Golly day, that's almost four million dollars in savings accounts. But wait, there's more. I think that you can actually open up more than fifteen savings accounts in Bank of America. Um, so again, what are you going to do with it? You know, I think that's probably the best place to put it. I also think that it's it's a neat idea, it's a cool idea to maybe have a little hoard of gold as well. If you're if if you have accumulated that much capital. And I would say put most of it in these FDIC insurance accounts, uh, these FDIC Bank of America savings accounts. And maybe take 5% of that, that hoard and put it into uh, gold maple leaf coins in a safe at your home. And um, maybe take another 5% of that and, and turn it into um, uh, $10,000 stacks of cash and put that into a safe at home. And uh, there's nothing wrong with having a safe at home if you've got, you know, 95 or 90 percent of your savings in an insurance uh, FDIC uh, savings account. Um, to me, like, I just don't, I just don't, I can't agree with these hyperinflationist people like Larry Burkett and um, Gary North, and I think even David Wilkerson might have gotten into some of this thinking in uh, America's Last Call. I'm not sure. I haven't gotten into his book yet, but, you know, some of that stuff is just based on chicken little um, paranoia of the sky is falling and the government can't be trusted, conspiracy theories. Can bank runs happen? Yes, they have in the past. Can hyperinflation happen? Yes, uh, that has happened in, in Argentina in 1988. But how likely is it going to happen? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we're talking about the failure of the entire United States as a country, 100% decimation of the country, for something like that to happen, for all savings accounts to, to be depleted. Um, I mean, it's not very likely, okay? Yeah, okay, if the country was completely decimated and leveled, would any money be left? No, probably not. It wouldn't be. But we're talking about like an end of the world scenario there, okay? So this sky is falling, sky is falling, chicken little type stuff, and these gold bug type people, they might have uh, something worth paying attention to, but most of the most astute financial gurus um, that I've read say basically, if you're going to own some gold, physical gold bullion, make sure that it's only 5% of your entire hoard of capital accumulation. Of all of the savings, of all the returns of, that you've accumulated, only put 5% of that into gold bullion. Because uh, that's, that's just a contingency to help you get rid of that fear. If you have any fear of hyperinflation, recession, bank runs, or the Great Depression scenarios, or or the United States is going to be destroyed, you know, scenario. Then go ahead and get yourself some gold bullion and make sure that it's five percent of everything you own. And then you'll 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 know that you're doing what most people that are in the financial community um, would consider to be prudent, a prudent response to that sort of a fear, um, and I would say most people would consider that a rational fear and a proportionate fear and an outcome of a, but it has to, the fear has to be proportionate to reality, and so the proportion of that possibility happening in the United States is so small, proportionately, that people say you should really only own about 5% gold bullion out of everything, out of all of your asset allocation. That's how likely they consider hyperinflation to be as a scenario, that they, that they would advise people to only buy 5% gold bullion out of all their assets. So... <laughs> Chicken little sky is falling. 
America's going to be destroyed type thinking really doesn't have to be taken that seriously. Anyway, so put most of it, most of your money and your savings, I'd say, into a savings account at Bank of America with FDIC and have the peace of knowing that you got $2.2 billion of government agency uh, insuring those savings deposits that you put in to the bank. God bless you out there. This is WesleyGospel.com.